everyone. So this is part two of our coverage of the Cyberpunk 2077 class action securities lawsuit filed by the Rosen Law Firm. We decided to break this up into two different videos so we could focus on the claims and then the class action part without hopefully overwhelming you. Let us know what you think about the format here by commenting in the description below. In the first video, we went over the basic securities law claims of the lawsuit and what the plaintiff needs to prove in order to win. In this video, we're going over how a class action lawsuit works and what someone needs in order to put one forward. Coming up on Legal Bites. So as you probably know, this lawsuit hasn't just been filed by one guy to get remedies by himself. The plaintiff filed this as what's called the putative class representative for a class of individuals that are similarly situated. Basically, a class action is where one or a small group of people file suit on behalf of themselves and other people who pretty much went through the same thing. That means that there are a whole bunch of other people out there that have been wronged by the defendant in the same way and for the same reason as the named plaintiff and that the plaintiff wants to represent all of their interests in one lawsuit. Of course, there are a number of requirements in order for this to work. And before I dive into those details, let me give you kind of a broad picture so that you can understand the process to place those details into. I kind of have to start by comparing a class action lawsuit to a regular lawsuit. In a regular lawsuit, you have certain phases to the litigation. First, you have what's called the pleading stage. That's where the plaintiff files a complaint that alleges everything wrong that happened. And then the defendant files a responsive pleading of some sort. You may have heard of a motion to dismiss where the defendant is trying to make the case go away. The defendant can choose to file that or what's called an answer where they basically go through the complaint and have to respond to each and every paragraph and say what facts and details that they admit and what they deny. Anyway, once this stage is finished, you go into what's called the discovery phase. I mentioned the discovery phase briefly in the last video. It's where both sides get a bunch of information from one another and it can actually get kind of downright personal sometimes. There are some limitations as to what a party can ask for from the other side, but for the most part, this is intended to be super broad, meaning courts are way more likely to make one side produce information to the other side in the interests of finding the truth. For example, if there are financial transactions involved, it may involve reaching into someone's bank account to see what all of those transactions have looked like for the past however many months or even years. But one thing to note about discovery, however, is that generally speaking, discovery does not involve the court. Judges want to stay out of this process as much as possible, so there are certain rules in place to keep the process orderly. So it really stays between the two parties, and it's only when one side is starting to look like they're either asking for too much information than what they're allowed, or alternatively, one side may be hiding information that they should be giving, that the parties will then go to the court and ask the judge to tell them how to proceed. That said, I've found that generally judges hate those kinds of issues. So as the lawyer involved, you really need to be on your best behavior there and otherwise try to work it out with opposing counsel without the judge's presence. This stage can be a huge headache, but it can also be really fun, especially when you find surprises that you didn't even know and that totally prove your case, like a secret unlawful recording of the defendant firing your client for unlawful reasons. Fun times. So then when discovery is over, that's when most lawsuits actually settle. Often you'll schedule a mediation where the mediator will try to bring the two parties together and find a sweet spot so that they can settle. But if it doesn't settle, then you get to prepare for trial and then ultimately go to trial. Or sometimes you spend weeks preparing for a trial and get as far as bringing about a dozen bankers boxes into the courtroom and the partner you're working for tells you that the parties have actually decided that they finally want to settle. <laughs> Anyway, the way that a class action case differs from all of that is that the earlier phases kind of get broken up a little bit. And that's because unlike in an individual lawsuit, in a class action case, you need to first decide if it's a proper class action case to begin with. And you do that by going through what's called class certification. In this phase, the two sides will usually do what's called limited discovery. This means that they can ask for any information that's reasonably necessary in order to get to the answer to the question that asks whether this case should be a class action. Then the two parties wrap up discovery and then they submit filings to the court where the plaintiff side argues that the class should be certified and the defendant usually argues that the case should 
should not be certified as a class action case. Assuming it gets certified, then the case normally proceeds somewhat the same way as a normal individual case would. And before I move on, I also want to mention this because it looks like there are likely to be multiple lawsuits filed by different law firms alleging the same thing. When you have multiple lawsuits filed for the same issue against the same defendant, a lot of times you'll see that the court will relate them, basically meaning that the cases get tied together so the court can keep them on the same radar field. And then what usually happens is that they get consolidated and the court will decide which plaintiff is going to represent the class. You can definitely have more than one class representative, but ultimately what the court cares about here is to make the process as smooth and streamlined as possible. So obviously the different law firms filing here are going to want their plaintiff to be chosen so that they can get their attorney's fees. Okay, so what do you need in order to certify a class? These are the requirements. First off, you have to identify a class period and you need to identify the class members. These two kind of go hand in hand, so bear with me real quick. The class period is the starting and ending point of time where you can identify a class member. As an example, in this case, the complaint lists the class period as spanning between January 16th, 2020 and December 17th, 2020. And the class members are people who bought stock in CDPR between those dates. If you remember, January 16th was the first time CDPR pushed back the release date, but said that the game was quote, complete and playable. And December 17th, 2020 was the day before Sony announced that they were issuing refunds and taking Cyberpunk 2077 off the PlayStation Store. So by setting up the class period between those dates, the complaint is carving out the class members as people who bought stock only after the allegedly misleading statements were made and while the investors were being harmed. This way, once you have a body of people in the class, there are certain things that you don't need to argue about anymore, which makes the lawsuit more efficient. For example, this ensures that everyone in the class can say that they knew about the statements CDPR made about Cyberpunk 2077 before they bought their shares. And then they can also say that they relied on those statements when they bought stock, thinking that they were making a good investment. So that's the class period and the definition of the class members. The way that this complaint does it, I think is pretty good. Now, aside from that, there are four prerequisite elements that have to be met in order to proceed in this case as a class action. Normal civil lawsuits don't have to do this. This is just for class actions. Those prerequisites are numerosity, commonality, typicality, and fair and adequate protection of class interests. The first two points are really talking about the class as a whole, and the second two are mostly referring to the class representative. So let's go through each one. Numerosity means that there have to be enough people in the putative class, meaning the class that's being proposed here, that it's not practical to make each one of them file a separate lawsuit. So obviously the number of people involved is one important part of that. And items that factor into the practicability are things like how much the damages are likely to be for each individual. So if there are a bunch of people in the potential class, but each person really only would get a small amount of damages, it doesn't make sense for each of them to file their own lawsuit if they're going to end up paying more in attorney's fees, filing fees, and other costs than what they would otherwise get from the damages. So that would be a situation that's proper for a class action. Second, the commonality element looks at whether the issues of law or fact are generally common to each person in the class. There can be some differences across class members, but the key elements that need to be proven in the case, like the ones that we talked about earlier in the first video, should be pretty much the same across the board. If the claims that you're looking at need to be proven on a fact-specific case-by-case basis, it's most likely not gonna be a proper case for a class action. In this case, I think this element is probably met because you have statements made to the general public by CDPR execs, and then you have a class full of individuals who each bought shares after those statements were made in anticipation of the release of Cyberpunk 2077. So common facts here, and the issues are all under the same language in the Securities Exchange Act. Third is typicality. Like I said earlier, this one is more about the class representative, whereas the first two were about the class as a whole. In this element, the plaintiff has to show that the person trying to be the class representative has claims that are typical of everyone else in the class. 
meaning his or her situation is about the same as your average class member. The class representative shouldn't have any prior relationship with the defendants that the other class members aren't likely to have. And the class rep also shouldn't have any insider information that your average class member also wouldn't have. This is because you want the class representative to be a fair and accurate representation of everyone else so that they don't have to go and file their own lawsuits. After all, the point here is to make the law a little bit more efficient, not to give the plaintiffs some sort of crazy strategic advantage. Applying this to this case, without knowing anything about the named plaintiff in this case, I can't really say whether his situation is typical of the average class members but the opposing counsel will definitely look to poke around to see how the class representative situation compares to everyone else. Okay, and finally, the plaintiff has to show that the class representative will fairly and adequately protect the interests of the class. Basically, this means that the class rep can't have some other conflict of interest between his or her own situation and the rest of the class. Courts will look for any source of antagonism or potential antagonism between the class rep and the class here. They may even look to the class representative's family members to see if any of them work for CDPR, for example. And that's because the plaintiff is supposed to be ready, willing, and able to represent the class member's interests fully. As a lawyer, I've told clients and prospective clients before in these types of cases that sometimes as a class representative, they even need to be ready at times to put the interests of the class above their own individual interests. And the last part of this fourth element is still about the class representative, but more specifically about the counsel retained by the class representative. Specifically, the lawyers filing the complaint will usually need to show at some point that they have enough lawyers and staff to work on the case and give it the representation that it deserves. That's because class action cases can be a huge undertaking. You need to make sure that you have enough lawyers that have enough experience in class action cases to do the job right. You also need enough lawyers to get all the information they need in the lawsuit, including the contact information for the class members so that they can give them proper notice of the suit. And then you also need enough staff to make phone calls to class members to try to get a list of people that will be willing to sit for depositions. And then all of that needs to be coordinated and scheduled to meet all kinds of deadlines. Okay, so those are the prerequisites for a class action case. On top of that, the plaintiff also needs to show that those commonalities in element number two predominate over any issues affecting individuals. I kind of touched on that already, but this is something that has to be addressed specifically in the lawsuit nonetheless. And finally, the plaintiff has to show that a class action is better than any other available method to fairly and efficiently adjudicate the issues. The court will look at a number of factors, including whether there's any interest by the class members in actually litigating their own cases and whether other lawsuits have been filed already. To me, it looks like this case won't have much of a problem certifying as a class action, of course, with an asterisk as to the details about the potential class representative and whether his situation is typical compared with their class members, etc. Otherwise, what do you guys think? Are you new to the subject of class actions? Do you feel like you understand them now? Does this seem like a case that is a proper class action to you? Let us know in the comments below. I hope that you enjoyed this video or at least found it informative. And if you did, we'd love it if you'd hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new to our channel and you like this kind of content, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell. We do deep dives like this all the time tying pop culture to legal analysis to explain the law and make it more accessible and understandable by everyone. Anyway, see you in the next video.